Hello everyone, welcome to Sunna IS and welcome to this lecture, much awaited lecture, the Mughals and um, we are going to complete the early, that is the great Mughals today and in the next class we are going to do the later Mughals, that is not so great Mughals because they did not have that kind of impact. So you know uh, Mughal, it was not just a dynasty, it was an empire. We see a lot of um, evidence, we see a lot of continuity from the Mughal Empire to the current times as well. We see architecture, we see um, practices, we see literature, we see even paintings, right? So everything has survived and uh, this is basically when modern India is just about to start. We consider modern India to be starting from the year 1707. Why? Because 1707 is the year when the uh, when Aurangzeb died. Okay, and Aurangzeb was the last great Mughal, right? Last greater Mughal. And always whenever we try to name the ages, we name the ages according to the primary custom, primary dominating power at that point of time, right? For example, when we name the Sangam age, we call it the Sangam age because it was the age of the Sangam literature. It was the age of Sangam practices, right? Similarly, Mughal age would be determining the end of medieval history and uh, modern history starts from 1707 when Aurangzeb dies, okay? So here you see the Mughals continued till 1857. But medieval India doesn't stretch till 1857. Medieval India ends at 1707. Okay, but we will study the entire Mughals. So we will study um, till 1857, whatever is necessary for studying the Mughals. So before we start, this is about our course, which is revised entire prelim syllabus through 3000 plus MCQs. We have already done modern history, Indian polity, geography, economy, environment. Now we are doing ancient medievals, then we will do art and culture, science and tech and finally current affairs. Purpose is to make you very well aware of the pattern of UPSC, the new pattern and to make you solve the questions. So if you want to solve the questions by yourself first and uh, then come to the class, then you go to purchase the course, right? And uh, come to the class only if and when required because time is very less now. You can contact on this number and visit this website. Okay? Chalo. So, before starting, just see the overall Mughal Empire. And Mughal Empire, why is it written 1530 to 1707? We know that Babur took charge in 1526. Right? 1526, he defeated Ibrahim Lodi in the first battle of Panipat. Then why have we written 1530? Because my dear, we are talking about empire. We are not talking about dynasty. When the period of 1526 to 1530 was there, then it was a dynasty, right? Many other dynasties were existing at that point, uh, at that point of time. For instance, uh, we have here uh, in the Bengal area, then there was Qutub Shahi dynasty, Adil, uh, Adil Shahi dynasty, Nizam Shahi dynasties, etc. So the point is that, uh, and Nizam Shahi was later on, but uh, the point is that not all the dynasties converted into empire. Okay. So when it started, the extent of Mughals in 1530 was around this purple area, okay, which Babur had consolidated. After that, by the year 1605, they had expanded to further heights. Then by the end of Aurangzeb, 1707, they had covered almost the entire India. And here also you will see that the extreme south of our country is still not directly under the Mughals. Same with extreme northeast. You must have heard about this personality called Lachit Borfukan, Bor Bor uh, right? Who defeated the Mughal forces in 
Assam, a home kingdom. So we have a lot of unsung heroes which are now coming into light and we need to know more about them because not just because, you know, UPSC is of course interested in them, but uh, we ourselves also should be interested to know. And of course, primary reason right now is to clear the examination. There is no other, there is no greater reason than that. Okay. So you have seen the broad outlook of Mughal Empire. Now, see here. This is the Mughal Empire family tree. Okay. So, who was the first? Babar was the first. Now, UPSC is going towards this trend of asking the lesser known people. So, we all know Humayun was the son of Babar. But who were the brothers of Humayun? Askari Mirza, Hindal Mirza, Gulruk Begum and Kamran Mirza. So, basically, the succession in Mughal Empire was not through the law of primogeniture. What is primogeniture? Primogeniture means that the eldest son will be taking over the uh, kingdom. But here, this was not the case. Here, the case was that whichever son is able to prove his might will be taking forward the uh, taking forward the Raj. So, Humayu was there. Then after Humayu, Akbar uh, came and Akbar's brother was Muhammad Hakim. Then Akbar's only surviving son, only surviving son I am saying is Jahangir. Jahangir had two other brothers also, but they died as uh, very young children. So, he had uh, Shah Murad, Danyal, uh, Shakarunisa Begum was the sister, Aram Banu Begum was the sister and Khan Zada Khanim was the brother. But he was the only surviving son. Then after Jahangir, who were the sons? Sultan, uh, Sultan Nisar Begum was of course the daughter. Khusro Parvez, Bahar Banu Begum was the daughter. Shehriyar was there. Jahandar was there. And this Jahandar is not Jahandar Shah of later Mughals. Okay. And we all know Shah Jahan. Okay. This is Khusra. And Shah Jahan's name was Khurram. Okay. So Khusrav and Khurram fought against each other and Khusrav won. Then Shah Jahan sang Aurangzeb Dara Shikho. You know both of them. Shah Shuja was also there. Jahanara Begum was there. Roshanara Begum was there. And Murad Baksh was there. You don't need to remember all the names. Just know broadly who were the major siblings, right? So, um, Shah Jahan, who was Khurram, his brother Khusrav is important. Okay. And here, before moving forward, let's just see a broad chronology of the Mughal Empire and how modern history is also proceeding accordingly. So, 1526, Babar invades India, conquers Delhi, Battle of Panipat. 1556, the coronation of Akbar happens. Akbar is the grandson of Babar. Son of Humayun. Okay. So, Akbar took charge when he was 13 years old. And uh, we'll study about how, you know, he had a regent and he ruled, Bairam Khan ruled on his behalf for a long time. Then 1600. 1600, you remember this year? We have studied in modern history. English East India Company started. In English East India Company was given the charter from the uh, Queen of England. Okay. Uh, Queen Elizabeth I. Then 1605, Jahangir became the emperor. 1615, Thomas Rowe reached Jahangir's court. Another important date which is not mentioned over here is 1608, William Hawkins reached Jahangir's court. Remember? Then uh, 1628, Shah Jahan becomes the emperor. 1658, Aurangzeb becomes the emperor. 1664, Shivaji sacks Surat. So, the Maratha kingdom is expanding. Right? Then 1707, Aurangzeb dies. Medieval India is over. 1710 to 11, governor of Bengal province stops sending revenue to the Mughal emperor. And now, Mughals will start, you know, Mughal empire will start dissipating. Mughals will not receive the revenue. Then new states will be formed like Bengal, then like Awadh, like um, uh, Hyderabad, etc. Then 1757, Battle of Plassey. Okay, East India Company defeats the Nawab of Bengal. Then 1857, we know, Revolt of 1857. And this is where 
Mughal Empire, Mughal Dynasty. Empire ended in 1707 only. But Mughal Dynasty ends in 1858, uh, 1857 and 1858. British Crown takes over the East India Company's territories. The Act for Good Governance of India. Now you have a broad outlook. Now let's start with the questions. Consider the following statements with regard to the Mughals. Arrival of Babur in India led to the establishment of the Timurid dynasty in India. After defeating Ibrahim Lodi in the Battle of Panipat first, Babur assumed the title of Ghazi. And in the Battle of Khanwa, Babur defeated the Rana Sangha of Mewar. So how many of the given statements are correct? So here, you see that first one is very obviously correct, but it is confusing. You might feel that, you know, no, Babur established the Mughal dynasty. Where is Timurid dynasty coming from? See, every ruler has an ancestor. And Timur was the ancestor of Babur. Okay, Timur was the ancestor of Babur. This is the same Timur who uh, attacked India. So, from the father's side, from the father's side, it was Timur who was the ancestor of Babur. And uh, from the mother's side, he was not very proud of his ancestry. So, he called himself a Timurid dynasty only. So, first is absolutely correct. Then second, after defeating Ibrahim Lodi, remember last Delhi Sultanate, the Lodi Sultanate, in the Battle of Panipat, first, Babur assumed the title of Ghazi. See, he did assume the title of Ghazi, but he assumed the title of uh, Ghazi after the Battle of Khanwa. Basically, Babur said that Ibrahim Lodi was not even a formidable enemy. In earlier times, when there were, you know, kings, the kings, took a lot of pride in fighting with the rightful enemy. Okay. So, Babur said that Ibrahim Lodi was not even a rightful enemy. He was not a good ruler. He was not a good military commander. But Rana Sangha of Mewar, who was a Rajput, he mentioned two kings. Okay. Rana Sangha and Krishna Devaraya. These two kings were the formidable ones. So, he, it was not a big achievement for Babur to defeat Ibrahim Lodi. But it was a big achievement for Babur to defeat Rana Sangha of Mewar. So, statement third is correct. That battle, battle of Khanwa, which happened in 19, uh, sorry, not 19, 1527. That was the battle wherein he defeated Rana Sangha. And that was the battle after which he took the title of Ghazi. Okay. So, that is there. So, second is incorrect. Only two statements are correct. And just let's see a little bit about Battle of Khanwa. Battle of Khanwa was fought at Khanwa in 1527. And it was fought between the invading Timurid forces of Babur and Rajput confederation led by Rana Sangha. This was the few times when major Rajput kings came under uh, Rana Sangha because they could see that there is a visible threat. Fine. Battle was a major event in medieval Indian history, although Timurids won at Panipat. But at the time, the Sultanate at Delhi was a spent force. That was long crumbling. To the So, again, Battle of Panipat was not a major battle, according to Babur. To the contrary, Mewar Kingdom, under the able rule of Rana Sangha, had turned into one of the strongest powers of northern India. Therefore, the battle was among the most decisive battles in the Mughal conquest. So, it was very clear that Ibrahim Lodi would, de uh, would be defeated, but it was to be seen whether Rana Sangha would be defeated or not. And unfortunately, he was defeated. Right? Chalo. Next. Consider the following statements with regard to Babur. Persian was the mother tongue of Babur. He wrote his memoir, Tuzuki Babri, which uh, provides a vivid account of India. And Babur is known to have written a didactic work called Mathnavi. How many of the given statements are incorrect? Incorrect statement is being asked. See, Babur was from the Timurid dynasty, right? The Timur's legacy from Central Asia. And where is Persia? Persia is Iran and Iraq combined today, right? So, his mother tongue was not Persian. His mother tongue was Turki. And 
आउट ऑफ तुर्की ऑल्सो देर वॉज अ सर्टन काइंड ऑफ तुर्की चगताई तुर्की ओके चगताई तुर्की वॉज द मदर टंग ऑफ बाबर सो फर्स्ट इज इन करेक्ट ही डिड राइट तुजुकी बाबरी इन तुर्की ओनली एंड बाबर इज नोन टू हैव रिटर्न अ डायडेक्टिक वर्ल्ड कॉल्ड मथनावी दिस इज एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट दिस इज कॉल्ड मथनावी और मसनावी ऑल्सो सो हियर ओनली वन इज द आंसर बट लेट्स जस्ट सी अ लिटिल बिट अबाउट वेयर ही केम फ्रॉम सी दिस इज ताजिकिस्तान दिस इज उजबेकिस्तान राइट सो बाबर ब्रॉडली केम फ्रॉम उजबेकिस्तान साइड ओके सो यू शुड हैव एन आइडिया एंड वेयर इज पर्शिया पर्शिया इज इरान एंड इराक ओके सो दैट इज वाई इट्स नॉट द सेम एरिया सो बाबर वॉज द फाउंडर ऑफ द मुगल एम्पायर एंड ही बेसिकली वॉन्टेड टू विन ओवर द फरगाना वैली दिस इज द एरिया ऑफ फरगाना वैली ओके दिस इज फरगाना वैली बट ही वॉज थ्रोन आउट ओके ही वॉज अ डिसेंडेंट ऑफ तिमूर एंड गेंगेज खान और चिंगेज खान फ्रॉम हिज मदर साइड and chinggis khan was a very brutal murderer you know, you know that you might have heard stories so um he was not proud of the legacy of chinggis khan but he was proud of the legacy of timur okay timur was also very brutal uh, ruler but still he was proud of it because he was at least a rightful ruler chinggis khan uh, the mongol he was a brutal ruler so he was not very proud of that legacy he was uh, given the post to his name of firdaus makani that is dwelling in paradise that is babar so you can ask uh, you can be asked uh, this question born in andijan in fargana valley this is fargana valley now in uzbekistan babar was the eldest son of umar sheikh mirza you don't need to remember these names just know a background okay and uh, great great grandson of timur Babar ascended the throne of Fargana in his capital Akshikat this name is important Akshikat in 1494 at the age of 12 and faced rebellion he conquered Samarkand 2 years later only to lose Fargana soon after so he went eastwards he conquered Samarkand but he was not able to retain it in his attempt to reconquer fargana he lost control of samarkand so he has lost control of samarkand he has lost control of fargana and he wanted to create his own kingdom and that is why mughal empire was an empire of india it was not like mahmud ghori or ghazni right uh, mahmud ghazni or mohammad of ghori right then uh, 1501 his attempt to recapture both the regions failed when uzbek prince mohammad shaibani defeated him and founded the khanat of bukhara babar's memoirs form the main source for details of his life they are known as babar nama also called tuzuki babri were written in chaktai turki his first language babar nama was translated into persian during the rule of babar's grandson akbar these kind of questions are very important that under whose reign was babar's uh, autobiography translated into persian so um, akbar's reign and eventually persian gained a lot of importance in indian subcontinent next arrange the following events in chronological order battle of chosa battle of gogra battle of bilgram so what are three what are these three battles first of all let's study about battle of all these three battles let's study about overall yes this is the most important battle now we are in the era of humayun okay babar's expansions babar's role is pretty much done so battle of chosa this is very important battle of chosa it was a notable military engagement between humayun and sher shah suri now who is sher shah suri where is he coming from sher shah suri was an afghan general please try to remember which was the previous afghan only one afghan dynasty which has been established in india uh, before the dynasty created by sher shah suri it was the lodhi dynasty lodhi dynasty was an afghan dynasty right so sher shah suri and humayun fought and humayun was the only mughal king mughal uh, you know sultan who ruled in two parts in india who ruled india in two parts and uh, it was fought on 1539 at chosa which is 10 miles southwest of baksar in modern day bihar in india why is this location important 
because in 1764 a battle of buxar also happened right shesha suri was assisted by his allies ujjainiya rajputs of bhojpur and uh, gautam rajputs who were led by the commander gajpati ujjainiya humayu escaped from the battlefield to save his life so battle of chosa is important because it led to the escape of humayu and creation of a sur empire shersha was victorious crowned himself fariduddin shersha babar's cousin Mil mirza hedar asserted that armies might have numbered over 2 lakh troops so big number then battle of kannauj why are we mentioning battle of kannauj when it is not there in the options battle of kannauj is also called the battle of bilgram and it took place at kannauj in uttar pradesh and uh, between shesha suri and humayun again humayun was again defeated right so two major battles that happened and the third one the battle of gogra this just let me change the pen color this battle of gogra which is there mentioned in the third one this was fought between the mughal empire and the afghans and this was not something that was um, done by humayun this was under babar's reign so this was in the year 1529 i told you right that babar spent his entire life in just consolidating the empire that he wanted to create because he had learned his lesson from fergana valley and samarkand that whatever area you uh, are able to get under your control you need to retain that area okay so battle of gogra happened in 1529 then comes battle of chosa exactly 10 years after that 1539 and then comes battle of bilgram 1540 both these battles humayun is defeated okay so here we have 2 1 3 these the answer fine important all the three are important okay question number 4 term of mughal army and meaning ahadis they were emperor's personal soldiers who are compensated by the imperial treasury owed alliance to the emperor Shebandis a type of militia that maintained law and order and apprehended dacoits and bargis soldier receiving horses arms dresses etc from the state how many of the given pairs are correctly matched so term questions every year some or the other questions are coming if you are lucky the terms that we will cover some or the other term will fit in and for instance let's say you get a question where in ahadis shehbandis and bargir what are these three known for okay and you get four options these are soldiers these are maybe weavers these are traders etc these are the kind of questions that are coming so here all these three are correctly matched ahadis were emperor's personal soldiers and they were compensated by imperial treasury they owed allegiance to the emperor so just like regular military okay Shebandis maintained law and order, apprehended dacoits. So it's like police. Shebandis and bargirs were soldiers receiving horses, arms, dresses from the state. So this is like again the army. So here all of the pairs are correctly matched. Next, consider the following statements with regard to Sher Shah Suri. He established the first Afghan dynasty over Delhi in India. his empire does not include kashmir and gujarat and he followed the policy of raising a permanent army by paying in both cash and jagirs so how many of the given statements are correct one statement you should be very sure about which is the first one that this is incorrect because we just discussed that the lodi dynasty was already a afghan dynasty in india so first is incorrect second is absolutely correct actually Shesha Suri did take over the uh, management of the Mughal Empire, but he was not able to take over the Gujarat side and Kashmir side because Mughal Empire at that point did not take over Gujarat and Kashmir. Okay, Gujarat was taken by Akbar, and in fact, um, Akbar celebrated the victory of Gujarat because when he won over Gujarat, that was the first time that he saw the ocean, right? and that is when he created the fatehpur sikri fateh means winning 
so that is there so this is about shersha suri and uh, second is correct and he did follow a policy of raising a permanent army see afghan people they are very good with strategy they are very good with armed forces so he raised a permanent army by paying in both cash and jagirs is absolutely correct only two is correct let's study a little bit about the sur empire and shersha suri so shersha suri let me change the color of the pen shersha suri and um, often called the just king sultan adil you can also be asked this right sultan adil who was asked who was called was the founder of sur empire in india a very just ruler a very good ruler overall and there are very good uh, legacies that he has left as well regent and later sole ruler of bihar until he defeated the mughal empire in 1540 fine uh, then uh, founding the sur empire establishing his rule in delhi crowning himself as the emperor after his accidental death in 1545 His son Islam Shah became his successor. Influence of his innovations extended far beyond the brief reign. So that's why we call it Sur Empire also because his his initiatives are still visible. For example, the GT Karnal Road, Grand Trunk Road, he built that. In his reign, he remained undefeated in battle, being renowned as one of the most skillful Afghan generals ever produced. Sher Shah was buried in the Sher Shah Suri tomb. uh and this is the tomb and it stands in the middle of an artificial lake at sasaram in bihar and it is a town on the grand trunk road gt road theek hai so that is important tomb finished its construction on 16th august 1545 three months following the death of sher shah humayu would later refer to sher shah as ustadi badshahan that is teacher of kings so um humayu the one who was defeated by sher shah he mentioned sher shah in a good sense right just shows how good sher shah suri was as a ruler okay so here b only two is the correct answer next one consider the following statements sher shah's empire was divided into sarkars which had two officers in in charge of administration Shikdar and Amin were officers in charge of administration of each pargana and Diwani Rasalat was the foreign minister who assisted the king so how many of the given statements are correct so um these kind of questions have been asked earlier and uh, again there is no limit to how much you can study these but then we'll still try so here all the three statements are correct his empire was divided into sarkars and in fact um there was a question also that was asked that sarkar subha pargana in that question subha is the biggest uh, unit right subha is the biggest unit uh, but here sarkar is the biggest unit in the shersha reign the next statement shikdar and amin were officers are in charge of administration this is also absolutely correct then uh, diwani rasalat was the foreign minister who assisted the king is also absolutely correct so here sorry uh, all three statements are absolutely correct you have got to know some new terms okay chalo so this is about the sur administration as much information as i could put forward for you i have done that so you can take a screenshot and um, study it okay i will not study all of it because i'll just be reading and explaining which i'm sure you can do that okay all right this is another one take a screenshot all right next one consider the following statements with regard to the land revenue administration under shersha suri Sher Shah introduced the system of collecting revenue directly from cultivators. Under his reign, the payment of taxes from land produce was accepted only in cash, and he introduced kabuliyat and patta systems in the field of land revenue administration. How many of the given statements are correct? 
you can see how important uh, Sher Shah Suri is in our history because, you know, he laid down certain ground rules of administration, which we still follow. So, yes, he did introduce the system of collecting revenue directly from cultivators, which later on translated into Ryotwari system. Ryotwari system. Later on became Ryotwari system, but he started collecting directly. So, it was not a British uh, system. But under his reign, payment of taxes was accepted only in cash is incorrect. We know how to deal with statements of only, right? 8 out of 10 times they are incorrect. So, we will go with the 8 out of 10 rule and it is going to help us, right? So, he used to accept payments in cash as well as in, uh, um, you know, food items and, you know, kind as well. So, second is incorrect. Introduce Kabuliyat and Patta systems. Now, you don't need to go into detail about what was Kabuliyat, what was Patta. Patta, though, you understand this term was used later on as well by the British administration. British administration in the Zamindari system, they use this term, right? So, this term is known to you. And how many of the given statements are correct? Only two are correct. Next one. Consider the following statements with regard to Shesha Suri. He introduced new copper coins called Dam or Dam, which remained in circulation for a very long time. He improved communications by laying many important highways like the Grand Trunk Road. And he introduced a system of horse posts or, or mail service carried by horses. So how many of the given statements are correct? Here, dam is important. You know, in Hindi, we say, kisi cheez ka dam lagana. You know, dam means cost of something. Right? So, he did introduce new copper coins called dam, which remained in circulation for a long time. This is correct. And GT Garnal Road, I have told you, GT Grand Trunk Road. And he introduced a system of horse posts, mail service carried by the horses. Absolutely correct. For faster communication. All three are correct. Next. Consider the following statements with regard to Akbar. He was born in Amarkot, a Hindu Rajput kingdom located in modern Sindh. In the initial years of his reign, Bairam Khan was his regent. And in the second battle of Panipat, he defeated Hemu, the then wazir of the Sur Empire. How many of the given statements are incorrect? Now we have reached Akbar the Great, the third ruler of um, the Mughal Empire. And uh, Akbar, he was born in 1542, lived till 1605, so lived for a pretty long period of time. And uh, he's also called Akbar I because later on Akbar II was also there. Right? He was the third Mughal emperor and 1556 to 1605 is his reign. Okay. Now... Humayu ruled in two parts, okay, from, uh, from 1555 to 1556 was his second part. Akbar, you would not say ruled in two parts, but Akbar in his initial days was not ruling himself, right? It was Bairam Khan who was the regent, who was ruling on the behalf of Akbar because Akbar was just a child. This is the picture of uh, child Akbar, okay? So, Akbar succeeded his father Humayun. Regent was Bairam Khan. Regent means basically caretaker, decision maker, right? Who helped the young emperor expand and consolidate Mughal domains. And after Mughal emperor Humayun was defeated at Chausa and Kannauj, uh, Humayun fled westward to modern day Sindh. Sindh today is in Pakistan, right? So he fled there. And uh, that is where Akbar was born in a Hindu kingdom. Okay. And a Hindu king basically gave him, um, gave Humayun place to stay. So that's why Akbar was very, and Akbar's wife, the beloved wife who gave him a son, Jodabai, also was a Hindu, right? So he was very fond of uh, Hindus. He was not antagonistic to them. And that, that comes from his history as well. There he met and married the 14-year-old Hamida Banu Begum, daughter of Sheikh Ali Akbar Jami. Uh, a Persian teacher of Humayu's younger brother, Hindal Mirza. 
Akbar was born to Hamida Banu Begum and Hamida Banu Begum is the same uh, woman who commissioned the Humayu stone okay uh, uh, when Humayu died so that is their following chaos over the succession of Sher Shah Suri's son Humayu reconquered so we know all of that now in uh, Kalanor Punjab the 14 year old Akbar was enthroned by Bairam Khan on a newly constructed platform which still stands and was proclaimed the Shehen Shah Bairam Khan ruled on his behalf until he came of age. Okay. So that is important. And um, Akbar and later on Bairam Khan, it was said that, you know, Bairam Khan also fell apart with Akbar, but Bairam Khan always remained, remained loyal till the end. There's a very interesting story, uh, reality actually, regarding the death of Humayu, that when Humayu died, because there was no able person and the only able person that was Akbar, was still a child, Bairam Khan needed some time to actually give out this news to the public. Humayu died from uh, falling from his library. So, uh, for some days, from uh, the Jharoka Darshan that happened, a fake Humayu used to wave his hands for the people. Right? So, this is the story. And these are the stories, you know, that we should be knowing. Consider the following statements. In the battle of Haldi Ghati, wait, wait, wait. We need to solve this first. Yes. Uh, okay. So, he was born in Amarkot, a Hindu Rajput kingdom in Sindh, yes. In the initial reign, Bairam Khan was his regent, yes. But in the second battle of Panipat, he defeated Hemu. This much is correct. But Hemu was not the wazir of the Sur Empire. Hemu was the former wazir of Sur Empire. He was at one point the wazir of Sur Empire. But when he fought with Akbar, he was basically a Hindu emperor. And he, he became the last Hindu emperor to rule India. Because after Mughals, there was no emperorship, right? we transitioned into democracy. So, Raja Hemu became the last Hindu king to rule over India. So, how many of the given statements are incorrect? Only one. And even if you got the third one wrong, it is okay because it is a very detailed statement. Okay. Next. Consider the following statements. In the battle of Haldi Ghati, the Mughal army was led by Man Singh. And Akbar abolished the pilgrim tax and later the jizya tax. How many, which of the given statements are correct? So, Battle of Haldi Ghati, you must have heard about it, but it's important to know such important battles. The year is also important. Haldi Ghati ki ladai, 1576, during Akbar's reign. And it was between the Mewar forces led by Maharana Pratap. We all know the name of Maharana Pratap. And Mughal forces were led by Raja Man Singh. So, why is it so iconic was because from both sides, the one who was leading the army was a Rajput. Raja Man Singh was also a Rajput, you know. So, these kind of uh, stories have made our history, you know. Even today, for instance, there in Palestine, uh, sorry, in Israel, when Israel and Palestine, uh, Israel and Hamas are fighting, in Israel also there are some former Palestinians who have... Uh, change their allegiance to Israel. So, for them, it is a very, uh, it's a, it's a very emotional thing, you know. Similarly, for just imagine the situation of Man Singh over here and even Maharana Pratap over here who were fighting their own kind, who were just ruling against each other, right? Mughals carried the day after inflicting significant casualties on Mewar forces, although they failed to capture Pratap, who reluctantly retreated, persuaded by his fellow commanders. So, that was there. Then, Mughals outnumbered the Mewar forces by a factor of 4 to 1. So, ek Rajput uh, fighter ke liye, there were 4 Mughal fighters. Despite initial successes by the Mewaris, the tide slowly turned against them. Pratap found himself wounded and the day lost, right? So, that happened and uh, despite the reverse at Haldi Ghati, Pratap continued his resistance against the Mughals through guerrilla warfare. So, 
Rana Pratap is considered one of the biggest guerrilla warfare experts in our country. Uh, same with uh, Shivaji Maharaj. So these are some people who are who have been the experts at guerrilla warfare. And by the time of his death, had regained much of his ancestral kingdom. So this is about Battle of Haldi Ghati. This is a scene from Battle of Haldi Ghati, and um, Rana Pratap and his horse Chetak. The stories of their, you know, valor and survival. They are very famous. So that is there. Now, uh, Battle of Haldi Ghati. Mughal army was led by Man Singh. Yes, and Akbar abolished the pilgrim tax and later the jizya tax. Yes. Both of them are correct. And second one, you could have, uh, first one is factual, you should be knowing it. Second one, you could have answered by logic because Akbar was overall a tolerant ruler, right? And what was jizya? Jizya was a poll tax basically for non-Muslims. So yes, he abolished it. So here, C, both are correct. Next. Consider the following statements. As part of his tolerant religious policy, Akbar adopted many Hindu beliefs and practices such as the doctrine of karma. Ibadat Khana was constructed at the cap new capital of Fatehpur Sikri as Akbar's private prayer chamber and he promulgated a new concept called Dini Ilahi which was a syncretic religion. Which of the given statements are correct? So as I told you, Akbar was very tolerant and he did create a new religion called Dini Ilahi wherein he accumulated all the good aspects from all the religions, right? And uh, that's why it became a syncretic religion. Unfortunately, it could not gain a lot of uh, popularity because of various, um, you know, various extremist believers who did not want to let go or reform their religion. But Akbar's Dini Ilahi was initial social religious reform movement before modern India. Right, so third is correct. As a part of his tolerance religious policy, Akbar adopted many Hindu beliefs and practices such as doctrine of karma. Yes, so from every religion, something good was taken and doctrine of karma was taken from, uh, from uh, Hinduism. But Ibadat Khana, though it was constructed at Fatehpur Sikri, it was not Akbar's private prayer chamber. Right, it was a place wherein he used to offer his prayers and also sit with other religious experts to devise his dini ilahi, right? So it was not a private prayer chamber. It was a pub, not public, but it was a sort of a conference hall, religious conference hall. So here second one is incorrect and one and three are correct. You see here, this is the ibadat khana from inside. And uh, this is the Ibadat Khana from outside in Fatehpur Sikri. It's a very famous tourist site. And um, it's it represents our unity, cultural unity that has existed in ancient times, in medieval times as well. Next, in 1579, Akbar issued the infallibility decree known as Mazar. What was the purpose of this decree? To start a new religious doctrine. To declare equality of all religions and to promote tolerance among the people. To declare Akbar's right to be the supreme arbiter in Muslim religious matters. And to, de ya fir, to declare him the supreme emperor of the whole of Indian territory or Hindustan. Now these kind of uh, questions wherein a translation is also given infallibility decree known as Mahazar. If only Mahazar is given, then you should not be attempting this question because it is very vague. But it is telling you that it is an infallibility decree that something has been created that is infallible, that is infallible, that is unquestionable, right? So this one is guiding you towards the right answer. So let's see which we can eliminate. Which options can we eliminate on the basis of this? To start a new religious doctrine, there is nothing of infallibility here. Declare equality of all religions, promote tolerance. This is a, this is again a very mild kind of a thing. Infallibility means extreme acceptance. So second is incorrect. Declare Akbar's right to be the supreme arbiter. This is a possibility. Or to declare him the supreme emperor of the whole of Indian territory. So 
either of them can be correct okay i won't be saying that you know you should be knowing that here this one would be correct either of them can be correct but here you have narrowed down to 50 50 okay so here the answer is c that akbar's right to be the supreme arbiter in muslim religious doctrines and matters would be mahzar okay so here c is the answer okay consider the following statements the land revenue system of akbar was called zapti or bandobast system he introduced a standardized measurement unit of land called ilahi gaj which was based on the gaji sikandri introduced by firoz shah tughlaq the basis of land classification by akbar was on the continuity or discontinuity of the cultivation and batais or ghala bakshi was system of payments directly to emperor which of the given statements are correct see upsc is not a fool in these kind of questions there is no point of giving only one only two only three only four because it's a difficult question so in these kind of questions upsc will also give you an option wherein you can eliminate now seeing the four options there is one option which you can eliminate on the basis of your logic see the second one he introduced a standardized measurement unit of land called ilahi gaj okay possible which was based on gaji sikandari by firoz shah tughlaq there was a king called uh uh sikandar uh, si uh, overall firoz shah tughlaq was there sikandar uh, tughlaq was there right so why would firoz shah tughlaq create a system which is named on other, another ruler right so gaji sikandari introduced by firoz shah tughlaq would be incorrect right and if you take that leap of faith then you will eliminate two and if you eliminate two you will arrive at the correct answer that is 1 and 3 okay so first is correct land revenue system of akbar was called zapti or bandobast system and it was created by raja todarmal raja todarmal he was the sort of finance minister or you know revenue minister of akbar then second one this particular uh, system was by sikandar lodhi not sikandar tughlaq i think i said sikandar tughlaq earlier sikandar lodhi this system was started by sikandar lodhi and uh, it was adopted by uh, akbar as well under another name called ilahi gaj theek hai so second is incorrect basis of land classification was the continuity or discontinuity of cultivation yes now the fourth statement on the basis of elimination you have arrived at this uh, conclusion that fourth is incorrect but now you should know why it is incorrect so batai or ghala bakshi system is actually not a system where payment was directly made to the emperor this was a system where in the revenue was divided revenue was divided into peasants and the state in a fixed proportion peasants and the state in a fixed proportion so here 1 and 3 is the correct answer all right next consider the following statements with regard to mansabdari system under akbar the mansabdari system was of central asian origin the mansab rank was hereditary for military and civil administration under the system all appointments and promotions as well as dismissals were directly made by the emperor and zat and sawar were types in mansabdari system so how many of the given statements are correct here i will not be asking you to use any logic anything because mansabdari system and jagirdari system these two have been asked earlier a separate question has been asked a question together on them has been asked so you need to know about this okay so mansabdari system was of central origin is absolutely correct okay why we are saying central asian origin because the overall uh, babar's heritage 
बाबर हेरिडिटी कम्स फ्रॉम सेंट्रल एशिया ओनली राइट उजबेकिस्तान फरगाना वैली सो इट इज सेंट्रल एशियन ओरिजिन इट इज नॉट एन इंडिजिनस सिस्टम मनसब रैंक वॉज हेरिडिटरी फॉर मिलिट्री एंड सिविल एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन ऑलवेज नो अबाउट नो दिस अबाउट अ स्ट्रॉन्ग रूलर एंड अकबर यू नो वॉज अ स्ट्रॉन्ग रूलर दे विल नेवर कॉम्प्रोमाइज मेरिट फॉर द हेरिडिटरी एस्पेक्ट राइट just for pleasing people they will never compromise merit so if they make mansabdari system hereditary then merit will be compromised mansabdars are basically military officials who were given land in lieu of their payment right so how can they make if the father is given rights as a mansabdar it is not as if the son will automatically become a mansabdar right the son has to earn it the son has to be equally capable as well so second one is incorrect and this is the exact thing that was asked earlier that mansabdari and jagirdari both are hereditary no they are not okay mansabdari is not under the system all appointments and promotions and dismissals were made by emperor yes actually the system later on led to the weakening of uh, mughal empire because quite a lot of land was given under the mansabdari system to various people and then after akbar land started being given to people just to please them also or to avoid war also okay so for example land was given to rajputs mansab and land was given to rajputs so that the mughal rajput uh, fight could be reduced right so that would what what will it do that would eventually reduce the effective land that is there with the king himself right so that was the problem uh third is correct and zat and sawar were types in mansabdari system yes this is correct zat is the rank fine and sawar would be the number of uh number of cavalry ghur sawar right people riding the horses so that's sawar so here only three are correct mansabdar let's just study a little bit about mansabdari system mansabdar was a military unit within the administrative system of mughal empire introduced by akbar so very important to know it is not as if babar introduced it or mughals already you know were following it it was devised by raja todarmal who was uh, akbar's revenue minister uh, revenue uh, revenue and finance minister and this was not an indigenous system so raja todarmal also tweaked it according to the needs of the empire the word mansab is of arabic origin meaning rank or position the system determined the rank and status of a government official and military generals every civil and military officer was given a mansab which determined their salaries and allowances the term mansabdar means a person having a mansab and in the mansabdari system founded by akbar mansabs were military commanders so you have to be very clear they were military commanders and uh, high civil and military officers provincial governors those mansabdars whose rank was 1000 or below were called amir were those uh, as those above 1000 were called amir al kabir some great amirs who ra whose rank was above 5000 were also given the title of amirul umar right so amir amirul kabil amirul umar these were mansab ranks system whereby nobles were granted the right to hold a jagir so jagirdari is a part of mansabdari okay and uh, for services rendered by them with the direct control of these nobles in the hands of emperor Asad Yar Jung mentioned sixty-six grades of mansabdars. In practice, there were about thirty-three mansabs. Fine, and uh, they were given the mansabs were given to imperial princes and Rajput rulers who accepted the suzerainty of the emperor, and that's why eventually the land under uh, the Mughal emperor kept on decreasing. Right? Okay. Next. consider the following pairs officers and their role amal gulzar responsible for maintaining law and order in sarkar muqaddam village head or sarpanch uh, shikdar maintained the general administration and law and order of the pargana so which of the given statements are correctly matched 
नाउ दिस पर्टिकुलर क्वेश्चन में द पेयर्स टू एंड थ्री आर करेक्टली मैच प्लीज सी इट वेरी केयरफुली टू से मुकदम टूडे इन लीगल लैंग्वेज वी ऑफन से द टर्म मुकदमा राइट तो मुकदमा कम्स फ्रॉम मुकदम मुकदम इज अ विलेज हेड और सरपंच who used to take over the judicial matters who used to give the you know judicial directions etc shikdar shikdar was the one who maintained the general administration of pargana pargana was one of the smallest units okay subha was the largest unit pargana was the smallest unit now amal gulzar amal gulzar was the revenue collector how will you remember it you can remember it by uh, the very famous writer gulzar and how he, whatever he wrote generated a lot of revenue right so amal gulzar revenue collector fine and overall this yes mukaddam was the village head or sarpanch and uh, shikdar was the one who maintained general administration law and order of the pargana fine so here 2 and 3 is the correct answer next consider the following pairs with regard to land revenue assessment under moguls assessment system and method kankut measuring the land and estimating standing crops by inspection nasak a rough calculation of the payable amount by the peasant keeping in mind his past experience and khet batai reaped and stacked crops divided in the presence of parties how many of the given statements are correctly matched so here there are some assessment systems that are given and how they were used to calculate and assess the revenue assessment system of what assessment system of revenue so see the first option kankut it was measuring the land and estimating standing crops by so this was kankut nasak means a rough calculation of the payable amount keeping in mind his past experience so it's like you know someone asking your ctc and uh, giving you your current salary on the basis of your previous drawn salary it's like that so that was nasak and reaped and stacked crops divided in the presence of the parties just like you know uh earlier times the ballot box was emptied in the presence of all the political parties but this system is called bhauli this is not called khet batai this is called bhauli and khet batai the people who know hindi would know this khet batai means division of land division of field field division okay division of field so third one is incorrectly match and b is the answer now if you ask me should you be knowing this you should not be attempting this question if you do not know all the three terms with certainty because now they are in this kind of question they will give you only one only two pair and they are testing you okay they want you to leave some questions they do want that you leave some questions so that's why they are testing you and if you don't leave these kind of questions then there is no point at all because some questions you need to leave right next consider the following statements with regard to jahangir he wrote his autobiography called tuzuki jahangir in turkish jahangir issued coins jointly in nur jahan's name and his own sir thomas ro an ambassador of king james the 1st of england came to his court and fakir azia or dini sufi mystic was one of the chief advisors of jahangir now this is a question which you should take courage in so jahangir you should be knowing that he did write uh, tuzuki jahangiri but by the time he wrote it the language that had become important in the court was persian persian language had become very important right the second one that jahangir issued coins jointly in nur jahan's name is absolutely correct nur jahan or mehruni sa was jahangir's wife and uh, in many ways was the one who was actually ruling right so yes 
the love story of Jahangir and Mehru Nisa is also very famous. It's a fable. So that is there. Thomas Rowe, ambassador of King James I of England came to his court. We all know that. This is a part of modern history and we studied this in this lecture itself. But the fourth one, Fakir Azio Dina Sufi mystic was one of the chief advisors of Jahangir. No. See, Jahangir was the one who was very much into um, paintings, even uh, architecture. But Sufism, not that much. Akbar was a lot into Su Sufism, right? Akbar, of course, he wanted to create the Nilahi, right? So he wanted to know that how is the Sufi movement going on? How is the Bhakti movement? What are the things that I can take from them? So here only two is the correct answer, right? Okay, let's study a little bit about Jahangir. This is a portrait of Noor Jahan and uh, Jahangir. So born Prince Salim, he was the third and only surviving son of Emperor Akbar and his chief empress, Mariul Zamani. Akbar's quest for a success took him to visit Sufi Saint Salim Chishti. So he was named after being appointed, he was named as Jahangir, but his name was Salim. And uh, it was he was named on the name of uh, Salim Chishti. A spiritual leader who prophesies the birth of three sons. Jahangi's birth in Fatehpur Sikri was seen as a fulfillment of Chishti's blessings. And he was named after him. Right? So that is there. So uh, the name of Salim Chishti also becomes important. And he was of course from the Chishti order. We will study about the uh, Sufi and Bhakti orders in the later class. His early life was marked by personal tragedy, including the death of his twin brothers in infancy, which led to a sense of grief in his family. His early education was comprehensive, covering various subjects, including Persian, pre-modern Urdu, military tactics. See, Jahangir was a very able ruler. Okay, he was not just a romantic. He was a very able ruler. He was very, uh, you know, very literate also. So that is there. Jahangir's upbringing was heavily influenced by cultural and spiritual heritage of his family, setting the stage for his later rule as an emperor. Then Jahangir's rule is distinguished by his commitment to justice and his interest in the arts. Jahangir's reign was characterized by a complex relationship with his nobility and family, notably reflected in his marriage to Mehruni Sa and who later became Noor Jahan who wielded significant political influence. So, Noor Jahan is also portrayed as a negative character in, uh, in our history because she had that kind of influence. But she was the one, one of the powerful women and it was very common to, you know, vilify women who had power at that point of time. Right? So, um, that is there about Jahangir. Okay. Next, consider the following events. Permission to the English to establish a trading port at Surat Complete annexation of Ahmednagar and the killing of Guru Arjan Dev, the fifth Sikh Guru. Which of the events happened in the reign of Jahangir? So just like in modern history, we study which important event happened under which viceroy. The early Mughals at least are important. And in the later Mughals, the, those events are important which were very significant. For instance, Battle of Plassey, Battle of Baksar which happened under which Mughal ruler. So, th these things are important. So, of course, permission to the English to establish a trading port at Surat was given, Thomas Rowe. Complete annexation of Ahmednagar could not happen. Again, complete is an extreme term. So, complete annexation of Ahmednagar did not happen. Killing of Guru Arjan Dev, the fifth Sikh Guru, that happened under Jahangir. And that's why Sikhs and uh, Mughals never had good relationships. Um, Eventually, later on, a lot of militancy of the Sikhs would happen. Lot of um, lot of uh, exploitation by the Mughals would happen. So, at one point, let's say under Akbar, the relations between the Mughals and uh, the Rajputs became better. But not so in the case of Mughals and Sikhs. Okay? Chalo. Next pe chalo. Identify the following Mughal king. He is known for his strict administration of justice. He established Zanziri Adal, that is chain of justice, at Agra Fort for the seekers of royal justice. 
He captured the strong fort of Kangra. Under his reign, Persian art and culture were promoted in the court. So is it Shah Jahan, Akbar, Jahangir, Babur? So here, upon seeing that strict administration of justice, you might immediately feel that okay, it might be Akbar or it might be Aurangzeb. But I specifically told you that Jahangir was an able ruler. He was not just a romantic. And he created a chain of justice. See, this is the Agra fort. Okay, and here it is said that a chain of justice was created by Jahangir. And this is the Kangra fort, okay? Northern side of India. So, he conquered the Kangra fort and Kashmir came into the uh, fold. So, yes, we are talking about Jahangir and the fact that who created Zanjiri Adal? It was Jahangir. Okay? Next. What were the Muttasadi and Shah Bandar during the Mughal rule? Judges responsible for civil justice at Pargana level. Head of the village and district administration. Governor and officers related to port and the Mughals. And uh, spies and ambassador during the Mughal reign. See, these kind of questions, either you know one of the terms, which is great. If you don't know, you can guess particularly this question on the basis of one term. Bandar. Do you know this port called Bandar Abbas? Right? Bandar Abbas in uh, Iran. Right? One is Chabar, one is Bandar Abbas. So, the term Bandar is used for ports. Right? If you take that kind of a risk, you will arrive at the correct answer. You just need to match this with this. Shaha Bandar. Shaha means the ruler. So the ruler of the port and Mutasadi. Both are the governors and officers related to ports under the Mughals. Okay. Now I'm not saying this will work every time. But because Bandar Abbas is a very famous place and it has been in history as well. So it is important that you know it. Okay. Next, consider the following statements with regard to Shah Jahan. He launched a successful campaign in the northwest frontier to recover Kandahar and other ancestral lands. He carved out four Mughal provinces in the Deccan, which were put under the control of his son Aurangzeb. So, which of the given statements are correct? Now we are we have reached the son of Jahangir, that is Shah Jahan. Okay, so Shah Jahan, he did launch a campaign in the Northwest frontier to recover Kandahar, but it was not successful. It was an unsuccessful campaign. But yes, he carved out four Mughal provinces in the Deccan, which were put under the control of his son Aurangzeb. So two only is the correct answer. Okay, so this is a little about, a lot about Shah Jahan. Shah Jahan, uh, the name basically is the king of the world. He was Khurram. Was the fifth Mughal emperor reigning from 1628 to 1658, a clear cut 30 years. During his reign, Mughals reached the peak of their architectural and cultural achievements. Third son of Jahangir, uh, Shah Jahan participated in military campaigns. So these are all about the military campaigns, right? He built the Red Fort, Shah Jahan. Uh, he commissioned the Red Fort, the Shah Jahan Mosque, the Taj Mahal. Shah Jahan Mosque is basically the Jama Masjid. Um, Taj Mahal created for Mamtaz Mahal. In foreign affairs, he presided over the aggressive campaigns against Deccan Sultanate, conflicts with Portuguese and wars with the Safavids. He defeated Portuguese also, right? And... Um, in 1657, Shah Jahan was ailing, appointed Dara Shikho as his successor. So he had, if a question comes, he had appointed Dara Shikho as his next generation. And uh, this nomination led to a succession crisis. And uh, Shah Jahan's third son, Aurangzeb, emerged victorious and became the sixth emperor, executing all the surviving brothers, including Crown Prince Dara Shikho. The search for Dara Shikho's grave is still on. Right. So that is there. After Shah Jahan recovered from his illness in July 1658, Aurangzeb imprisoned his father in Agra fort. And from the Agra fort, from his room, he could directly see the Taj Mahal and where his wife was buried. Okay. 
During Shah Jahan's time, Islamic revivalist movements like Naqshbandi began to shape Mughal policies. So, Islamic revivalist movement, we will study about the Naqshbandi Silsila also. So, important. Aurangzeb was also a follower of Naqshbandi Silsila. Alright, consider the following travelers. Tavernier, Nicolo Manuki or Bernier. How many of the uh, above foreign travelers visited during the reign of Shah Jahan? So, here all the three given, uh, Tavernier, Manuki and Bernier, all three visited during Shah Jahan. Okay. Next. Consider the following architectures. Bacha Taj Agra, Salim Chishti Tomb, Fatehpur Sikri, Jama Masjid, uh, Delhi. How many of the given state, uh, how many of the above buildings was or were constructed during the reign of Shah Jahan? See, what is Bacha Taj? Bacha Taj, I'll show you the three monuments first. Bacha Taj is basically this. Bacha Taj is the tomb or the tomb of Itamod Dola. It is the tomb of Itamod Dola. And who was Itamod Dola? He was Noor Jaha's father. Noor Jaha who? Jahangir's wife. So who would commission Bacha Taj? It would be under Jahangir. Okay? It was the inspiration People say Humayun's tomb was also the inspiration. Bacha Taj was also the inspiration. But both these were before Taj Mahal. So Jahangir commissioned it. Now we have Jama Masjid. Jama Masjid was in fact commissioned by Shah Jahan. So this was definitely commissioned by Shah Jahan. Now think about it. Who was the ruler who was forever grateful to Salim Chishti for giving him a son? It was none other than Akbar. So, who will build the tomb of Salim Chishti? It would be Akbar. Okay. So, here only one that is Jama Masjid is created under Shah Jahan. Clear? Next. Consider the following statements with regard to Aurangzeb. He fought against the Safavids and captured Kandahar. He defeated Sikandar Adil Shah and annexed his kingdom of Bijapur. He eliminated the Qutub Shahi dynasty of Golconda. So, we have reached the last great Mughal. And uh, about Aurangzeb, he uh, did not fight against the Safavids. We have just studied, it was actually Shah Jahan, the father of Aurangzeb, who fought against Safavids and captured Kandahar. So, first is incorrect. The rest of the two, by elimination also, and overall, as matter of fact also, he defeated Sikandar Adil Shah, annexed his kingdom of Bijapur and eliminated the Qutub Shahi dynasty of Golconda. Both the statements are correct. If you see Mughal Empire uh, under Aurangzeb by, by the time of his death, you see that it is the widest possible expanse of Mughal Empire. Okay. Uh, Aurangzeb, led, uh, Aurangzeb led to the maximum expansion of the Mughal Empire. So, you see here Kashmir is under uh, the Mughal Empire now. Kabul is there. Kandahar is not there. Kandahar is also in Afghanistan, but Kandahar is not there. Peshawar is here. Sindh is here. Uh, fine, Gujarat of course is here. It came under uh, Akbar only. Bengal is there, but again, southernmost side is not there. Okay? So, that is... Okay. Consider the following statements. Shah Jahan defeated the Portuguese. Shah Jahan secured Kandahar and he held the territory till his successor lost it to Persia. Which of the given statements are correct? I just told you that Kandahar could not be captured. Right? So, um, Kandahar was captured for a very brief period of time. But it went again to Persia and Shah Jahan lost it. Okay. But yes, he was the one who defeated the Portuguese. Us time pe the real enemy, the visible enemy was Portuguese. It was not the British. The British had arrived. In 1608 only they had arrived. But they were not the real threat. Portuguese were the real threat. Because Portuguese were constantly converting people. They were violent, etc, etc. So here, one only is the correct answer. So you can see here that... The siege of Hooghly, it was a military engagement between Mughal army and Portuguese. Result was capture of the fort, expulsion of the Portuguese. Not expansion, expulsion. So, you can take a screenshot. Just this much you need to know, not a lot of detail. 
Consider the following architectural developments during the reign of Shah Jahan. Moti Masjid, Sheesh Mahal, Taj Mahal, Musamman Burj, Jama Masjid. How many of the above were constructed in Agra? Because Shah Jahan was such a lover of architecture, that's why you need to know this. Uh, all of them were in Agra except for Jama Masjid, which was in Delhi. Okay, Jama Masjid is in Delhi. Rest all were in Agra. So, only four is the correct answer. Next. Consider the following pairs. Personalities and work. Inayat Khan built the peacock throne. Dara Shikho translated the Bhagavad Gita to Persian language. Be, uh, Be Badal Khan uh, wrote Shah Jahan Nama. So, how many of the given statements are correct? See, Dara Shikho was a very liberal person. He did... Translate the Bhagavad Gita into Persian language. But Shah Jahan Nama was written by Inayat Khan and Bebadal Khan built the peacock throne, which was later away taken by Nadir Shah, okay, while he invaded. So here only one is the correct answer. Consider the following statements with regard to Aurangzeb. He created a separate department to enforce moral codes under an official called Muhtasib. He restarted the cultivation and use of drugs and he allowed music in the Mughal court and Jharoka Darshan. Aurangzeb was a religious fanatic. So he was against Jharoka Darshan. He was against anything fancy. He wanted simplicity and he stopped the cultivation and use of drugs. So the use of, uh, you know, hookah, the use of alcohol, the use of uh, any kind of intoxicants was banned by Aurangzeb in Aurangzeb's court. Now, before Aurangzeb, the kind of uh, extremist that Aurangzeb was, we saw this extremism in one more king in Delhi Sultanate, which was Balban. Balban, the last significant king of the slave dynasty. We have studied about it. Right? So, uh, similar. But first is correct. He created a separate department to enforce moral codes. Um, under an officer called Muhtasib. So, only one is the correct answer. Next, consider the following buildings constructed under the Mughal rule in India. Badshahi Mosque, Lahore. Bibi Ka Makbara, Aurangabad. Moti Masjid, Red Fort. How many of the buildings were constructed during the reign of Aurangzeb? So, although he was not a lover of the arts, he was someone who wanted to express himself through architecture. He, he also, um, he also, you know, wrote a lot of Persian and Quranic verses, right? And he earned out of it. So, how many of the buildings given above were constructed during the reign of Aurangzeb? All the three were constructed during Aurangzeb. Badshahi Mosque. Badshah here is Aurangzeb himself. So, this is the Badshahi Mosque and this is Bibi Ka Makbara. Bibi Ka Makbara is basically for Aurangzeb's wife and um, he really loved her. So, this is like a mini Taj only. So, there are two mini Taj. One is Taj Mahal, of course, and two mini Taj. Uh, one was created before Taj, that is Bacha, Bacha Taj, uh, tomb of Itimuddola. And one is the Bibi Ka Makbara created by Aurangzeb, tomb of... Uh, tomb of um, Itamodola was created by Jahangir, right? And this is Moti Masjid in Red Fort of Delhi, fine? Red Fort of Delhi was created by Shah Jahan. Red Fort of uh, Agra was created by Akbar. Fine, so here that is there. Chalo. Next, identify the following Mughal emperor of India. He was one of the ablest of the Mughal kings. In his private life, he was industrious and disciplined. He earned money for his personal expenses by copying Quran and selling those copies. He was a lover of books. He was a learned and professional in Arabic and Persian languages. He assumed the title of conqueror of the world. So he was a simple man. He was a very able man. He was Aurangzeb. A religious fanatic as well. But uh, this is the key line over here. That he earned money for his personal expenses by copying Quran and selling those copies. Okay, so C is the correct one. Alright. Last question for the day. 
which of the following persons was or were the contemporary of Aurangzeb? Guru Teg Bahadur, Chhatrasal of Bundela, Lachit Barpukan. How many of the given statements are correct? Lachit Barpukan, the name might be ringing a bell because he won the Battle of Sarai Ghat. And it was a naval battle in 1671 between Mughal Empire led by Kachwa Raja Ram Singh I and a home kingdom led by Lachit Borfukan. So Lachit Borfukan was able to defeat the Mughal army, which was a very mighty army, that too under Aurangzeb. Uh, right. So the Ahoms, smarting from the occupation of the capital by Mir Jumla and harsh conditions of Treaty of Ghilajari Ghat, decided to lure a Mughal imperial force to Sarai Ghat and take a stand there. Fine, although weaker, a home army defeated the Mughal army by massive army clever diplomatic negotiations to buy time. So, a very, very well won uh, war. A newly erected statue for Lachit Borfukan has been uh, started, uh, you know, launched. So, that's why the personality becomes very important. Guru Teg Bahadur and Chhatrasal of Bundela. Guru Teg Bahadur Sikh, Chhatrasal of Bundela. Um, and Lachit Borfukan. All three were contemporaries of Aurangzeb. So here all three is correct. All right. So we are at the end of this very long class. I know that uh, this was a long class. 31 questions we did. Mostly we do 15 to 20 questions, maybe 25. But uh, we have done Mughals to the maximum possible capability. The basics we have not done, you know, like for instance, um, who was the ruler who died playing Chogan in Delhi Sultanate? Or who was the ruler who died from his library, you know, falling around? These kind of questions we are not doing because everyone knows it. But the kind of deep-seated questions that can be asked, including terminology, we have tried to cover it, right? The next class, we will be covering the later Mughals and other provincial kingdoms. And after that, we will go towards Bhakti, Sufi movement, etc. and then art and culture. So, thank you so much for attending this class and let me know if you liked it and derived value out of it. I'll see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.